Few things exhibit as much disdain for basic physics as the space levels in Nintendo Star Fox, except the barrel roll. barrel roll. That part might be legit, and today I'm gonna demonstrate how it could work. Space battles in games and movies are laughably unrealistic. Ships that bob and weave, laser cannons galore, and giant explosions all make for good drama, but bad physics. Joe Hansen over at It's Okay To Be Smart has a great episode on how pop culture gets space battles all wrong. I'll leave that to him though, because I want to focus on one thing that the gaming world may have gotten right the Star Fox Barrel Roll. In general, Star Fox flushes physics down the toilet during the space levels, but the infamous Barrel Roll, the maneuver that seems most crazy and that Peppy is shouting at us to execute every five Do seconds, might be the most physically viable part of the game. Now let me be clear, we're only talking about the space levels. When the R-Wing is in a planetary atmosphere, a Barrel Roll is child's play, it's aerobatics 101. Just like a regular airplane, you flip the ailerons, which are these panels on the wings, in opposite directions, up on one wing, down on the other. That creates a differential in the atmospheric force applied to the top and bottom of each wing. The net force will push up on one wing, down on the other, torquing the plane like a doorknob around its longitudinal axis. To stop after a 360, you quickly reverse the ailerons, thus flipping the direction of the forces on the wings and torquing the ship back to a state of zero rotation. So in an atmosphere, the maneuver is all about the ailerons. In fact, Matt Pat over at Game Theorists correctly pointed out that the technical name of this move is an aileron roll. In a true barrel roll, the whole aircraft moves along a helical path, corkscrewing rather than just rotating around its axis while moving straight. But the meme-tastic name barrel roll has stuck, so I'll just keep using it here. Back to space. Ailerons don't do anything for you in space because there's no air pushing on the wings. So, how do you torque the ship to get it spinning and then stop it after a full 360? Because in case it isn't obvious, once you get the ship spinning, it won't stop on its own. There's basically no friction in space. So any rigid spinning object, like a planet, will continue to spin at exactly the same rate along the same axis until something applies a torque to change that spin. That tendency to keep rotating is called an object's angular momentum, and physicists represent it by a vector or an arrow. Roughly speaking, that arrow points along the axis of rotation in the same direction that the thumb of your right hand would point if you curl your fingers in the sense of the object's spin. So say you want to do a barrel roll that's clockwise as viewed from the rear. To do that, the ship needs to acquire a forward-pointing angular momentum vector. To stop, that angular momentum must be removed. Now on a planet, the clockwise and subsequent counterclockwise torques required to do this are provided by the atmosphere. But in space, there's no air to push on the wings. So I'll repeat, how do you torque the ship? One option is to put small thrusters on the top and bottom of each wing. One quick burst to start the ship rotating, and then another opposing burst to stop it. That could certainly work, but it means carrying extra fuel for the thrusters to get those big torques over and over. That would weigh down the ship, so it seems wasteful. Also, I don't see any thrusters like that in the R-Wing blueprint. But what if you could store up the angular momentum in advance and carry it with you? And I don't mean having the ship doing a non-stop barrel roll, I mean having angular momentum on demand without thrusters. Could you do it? Yep, using gyroscopes, or to be more technically accurate, flywheels, which I'll sometimes refer to as gyros because it's easier and because I'm hungry. Now the trick is a lot easier to show you than to tell you about, so here we go. Here's the basic idea. By rotating the flywheel quickly, I end up transferring its angular momentum to myself, so I start spinning. Pretend the axis of my torso is the longitudinal axis of the R-Wing, with the ship's nose toward my head and the engine and wings down by my crossed legs. Imagine the ship has been preloaded with an already spinning flywheel, like the spinning bike wheel you see on the screen. That flywheel is spinning clockwise as seen from the rear of the ship, or counterclockwise as seen from the nose. So its angular momentum vector points toward the nose of the ship, which here is the top of your screen. You can also think of this vector as the net angular momentum of the entire ship flywheel system, all of which currently happens to reside just in the wheel, with zero angular momentum in the fuselage. When I flip the flywheel 180 degrees, its individual angular momentum starts pointing toward the rear of the ship, i.e. toward the bottom of the screen. But the net angular momentum of the entire ship wheel system must remain unchanged. That can happen only if the entire fuselage acquires its own large forward-pointing angular momentum that, combined with the wheel's angular momentum, nets out to the same total angular momentum vector we began with. It's just vector arithmetic. Flipping the flywheel thus causes the ship to barrel roll. To stop the roll, you just flip the flywheel back to its original orientation. Boom. Here's a view from the nose of the ship. You're flying along, and all of a sudden... Do a barrel roll! Alright, Peppy. So that, more or less, is a barrel roll in space. Sorry, an aileron roll, minus the ailerons. 
Space telescopes like Hubble and Kepler also use angular momentum conservation to turn without thrusters. The difference is that their flywheels point in a fixed direction and get spun opposite to the way they want the telescope to turn. Kind of like the teacup ride at Disney World. But similar to our Star Fox setup, the ISS does rotate pre-spun flywheels to control its orientation. They're called control moment gyros. If you want to feel this physics in action, just get a bike wheel with some pegs, clamps to add mass, a spinning chair, and a couple of friends. You can do what I did. Now, all of this has just been a proof of concept demo. I don't have any numbers on the mass and rotational inertia of a Star Fox R-Wing. So I can't tell you how massive or dense the gyros would need to be, whether you'd flip them mechanically or with magnets, or how fast they'd have to spin in the first place to store up enough angular momentum for the barrel rolls. So from an engineering perspective, there are still lots of unanswered questions, including what a space meter is, which is apparently the official unit of measurement in the Star Fox universe. But assuming you can spin a massive enough flywheel fast enough without its breaking apart, and assuming the friction in the wheel is really low, then unlike with thrusters, you can keep storing and reusing that angular momentum to do as many barrel rolls as you like. Just knock yourself out. In fact, automotive engineers are trying to make flywheels the braking mechanism in cars to avoid losing energy to friction every time you stop. Now before we sign off, there's one little caveat that I've swept under the rug. Our flywheel flipped fast, but not instantaneously. In the process both of flipping and of flipping back, its angular momentum vector sweeps through a bunch of partially sideways directions. To compensate, the ship would have to do some wonky rotating as the flywheel flips in order to keep the total angular momentum vector unchanged. That means during each barrel roll, the ship's nose will tilt, some combo of left or right or up or down, depending on exactly how we flip the gyro. But there is a way to stop this. So, challenge. Can you come up with a simple design to keep the ship on axis during the barrel rolls without thrusters? Don't put your answers in the comments. Instead, email them to pbsspacetime at gmail.com. Your answers need to be clear. If I can't figure out what you're saying, no dice. We'll shout out people who submit correct answers on the next episode of Space Time. Last week, we talked about what might destroy planet Earth, and you guys had a lot to say. A lot of you ended up raising many of the same alternate Earth destruction scenarios. So this week, rather than shout people out by name, I'm going to address the scenarios you all raised collectively. Before I do that, let me make a disclaimer about how I chose scenarios for the episode. I wanted them to be based on understood physics that had some non-microscopic probability of occurring. Or, if I allowed in any speculative physics like the Big Rip, there had to be at least some experimental or observational evidence behind it. So bear in mind that many of the scenarios you raised, while technically not impossible, fail to meet one or both of those criteria. Among the more speculative scenarios that were raised, gray goo, the possibility that advanced nanobots might disassemble the planet atom by atom, and proton decay, that maybe protons are unstable, and in quadrillions of years, individual nuclei will start falling apart. I guess technically not impossible, but they also have no experimental basis, so now you know why I didn't include them. Another possibility raised is that maybe there exists an exotic but more stable state of nuclear matter involving strange quarks, and that if some of that matter appeared on Earth, it would trigger a chain reaction wherein every nucleus on Earth would revert into that state. Physicists have considered this possibility, and if it were likely, it probably would have occurred in particle accelerators already. So we're probably cool. Lots of you asked whether Earth could suffer a collision when the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies merge in about 4 billion years. Answer? The probability is near zero, way lower than one in a billion. How come? There's so much empty space between star systems and galaxies that the probability of any two of them colliding would be similar to the probability of two tennis balls colliding if I filled all of space with tennis balls but had a gap of more than three miles between any two of them. Likewise, people ask whether rogue planets or rogue black holes streaking through the Milky Way could come in and collide with Earth. Again, extremely low odds of collision, even if there's hundreds of millions of those things flying around the Milky Way. Actually, I will address two comments individually. Colwyn brought up that Ceres is actually the largest asteroid. This is actually my mistake. I thought that the dwarf planet and asteroid designations were mutually exclusive. They appear not to be. But even if Ceres is an asteroid, it's only about three and a half times as massive as 4 Vesta, still not enough energy to destroy the Earth. Finally, Paul Ansel asked a very thought-provoking question. He wanted to know how much energy it would take, not just to overcome the gravitational attraction between all the matter on Earth, but to split apart every interatomic bond as well. I actually don't know, but this could be worked out. You just need to know how much energy there is in interatomic bonds per atom on Earth and multiply that by an estimate of the number of atoms on Earth. I encourage you to work it out and let me know what you get. Great comments as always. Keep them up. And if you like the show, please remember to subscribe.